Vigan Group today. Uh, I'm Daniel Romero from Vigan's Marketing, Anesthesia and Emergency Department. And I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Peshansky, who is going to present the use of CPAP and oxygenation COVID-19 patients. Uh, Professor Peshansky has been practicing in the field of emergency medicines over 20 years. He's currently working in the Department of Emergency Medicine in Pontchaillou University Hospital, uh, which is in uh, Brittany, in France. And he has been a scientific committee member of the French Society of Emergency Medicine since uh, 2000. Professor Vyshansky will give his presentation, and at the end, uh, we will answer your questions, which you can write on the chat room available on the bottom right uh, side of your uh, screen. Nevertheless, we have, uh, at the, before that, we have questions that uh, we have received commonly from uh, customers that we wish to, uh, to answer to you. Finally, I would like to inform you that this webinar is recorded. Let me uh, now hand over to Professor Peshansky to start the presentation. All yours. Thank you, Daniel. Um, everybody, welcome. I'm very pleased to give you this uh, webinar about the oxygenation support regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, please don't hesitate to ask uh, as much questions as you want uh, on the right side in the chat section. And I will be pleased to answer most of your questions. And if you have more, uh, don't hesitate to send message to Daniel or Vigan Group. Um, let me have time to answer your questions. So I'm Nicholas Peshansky, uh, as Daniel said, practicing for 20 years and for one year now in the University Hospital in, in Rennes, Brittany, France, with a major uh, tertiary center in, uh, in this uh, region of France. So. Uh, you see it's extreme uh, west of uh, uh, western part of Europe and uh, represents around uh, 1 million point four inhabitants and it's the major uh, trauma and, and medical center for all Brittany. Uh, our department, uh, our emergency department, uh, get around uh, 65 attendees every year, and uh, uh, you have to add uh, 8,000 for uh, ophthalmology, 8,000 for gynecology, and, and more than 28,000 for pediatrics. Uh, regarding the the second wave peak that we have during this pandemic, uh, you see that we we had a maximum of uh, 54 uh, patients in our uh, ICU and CCU uh, wards. Um, we treat during the first wave a bit few patients surrounding uh, 574, but more than uh, triple that uh, number during the second wave. Uh, and regarding my department, we had more than 100 uh, critical care transportation from uh, secondary and primary centers to our centers, uh, for example, to put on uh, ECMO. And uh, with a, a very good improvement uh, of the mortality rate from the first wave to the second wave, uh, decreasing for more than a third of the patients to uh, less than 24% uh, in ICU world, for example. At the time we set this uh, webinar uh, presentation, the, uh, late November, we had uh, actually 124 patients hospitalized uh, with 31 in ICU and 12 in CCU. So let, let's begin now about our topic today, uh, focus on the oxygen oxygen support during the, this pandemic. As you may know, uh, the first uh, guidelines we had was regarding, the, regarding this uh, oxygenation was an objective of uh, SpO2 uh, more than 93% uh, uh, set by the WHO and with very few um, beside support as uh, WHO ask if you need more than 5 liters or 6 liters per minute 
you have to put on uh, an intubation. So the actually the, the first uh, guidelines we had were very black and white decision to do. And uh, uh, either you start it with the nasal cannula uh, or uh, very quickly you have to go to the ETT and, and put the patient under mechanical ventilation, uh, if possible with video laryngoscopy. Uh, either than uh, than the direct laryngoscopy so why that uh, and the, the the principle is to limit the viral particle spreading and regarding regarding uh, one of the very few articles published on the subject you can see that uh, using for example the nppv uh, is a, a a device who will spread a lot of viral particles with uh, almost uh, 100 centimeters and even with the low flow uh, oxygen mask you still spread uh, the particles at more than 30 centimeters and decreasing until the the, the nasal cannula and the hfno and uh, normal respiratory mask so um, during the, the the first wave uh, we had to leave uh, in life uh, some decision, clinical decision and clinical practice that came from uh, 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 outside of our country and uh, especially from Italy who, were, who was the, 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 the country must, mostly hit uh, during the first part of the first wave in Western Europe and has, we have very close link with our uh, uh, Italian colleagues. We, uh, we share information very quickly to be ready to, to, to set this, uh, this uh, oxygenation uh, uh, issue regarding our patients. And the first who gave us some information was the Professor Gattinoni in Milano, who uh, rapidly uh, um, ran the the difference between two types of patients uh, with what he called uh, uh, a, a type L with, uh, with the meaning of low elastance, uh, ARDS, and the type H more commonly uh, uh, seen, uh, ARDS. So these two different phenotypes of ARDS uh, need different type of oxygenation supports. That was the main information that the ICU physicians gave us to be prepared um, to struggle the, the, the pandemic in France. So um, this, this was the, the first description of a, a, a kind of atypical ARDS with the same virus but two phenotypes. Uh, as I said, the type L is uh, with low elastance, that means uh, high compliance, with low V on P ratio, a low lung weight, and low recruitment. Uh, actually, with very few uh, 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 images on the, on the CT scan. And the more commonly seen uh, type H with high elastance, a huge uh, shunt from the top right to the left, uh, high lung weight, especially uh, on the backyards of, uh, of the lungs, and uh, high uh, recruitment possibility. And when, once we, we study uh, how many patients uh, uh, get this uh, different type of, of phenotypes, uh, at the end of the CCU and ICU uh, um, time, uh, you can see that uh, a, a part of the patients uh, st still at the type L state, stage and uh, with 15% uh, uh, versus the 95, uh, the 85% more commonly seen uh, typical ARDS. Uh, the 85% the of those patients uh, correspond uh, of the Berlin criteria and it was uh, a more 
uh, typical uh, setting for the for those patients in the ICU. So during the first wave, uh, we uh, had these lessons uh, mainly from from northern Italy and and Spain, that uh, from the early rules gave by the WHO, uh, meaning the early intubation as soon as the oxygen need is more than six liters per minute. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, shift to the, an upgrade with the possibility to use the H A, uh, HFNC that started uh, especially in the northern part of Spain, in, in Catalonia, uh, or non-invasive oxygen supports that were used and, and possible to use with uh, uh, a limited uh, spreading uh, regarding the healthcare workers. And also, uh, information that we get from especially the physicians in New York about the, 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 the vital uh, prone positioning. Uh, as you can see that, uh, uh, they started it uh, in, in New York during the first wave with uh, uh, the possibility to put the patient on prone position even uh, where, where they not uh, intubated and sedated. Uh, and the first uh, guidelines uh, that uh, uh, include this difference were uh, from the Society of Critical Care Medicine in the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, who said the possibility to use the HFNC and uh, avoiding uh, the endotracheal intubation and uh, even tr trying to put the and non-invasive PPV uh, set and uh, a close control of that if you need uh, the endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. So uh, there was a shift. There were there was a shift from the guidelines and and many many uh, teams uh, around the, the globe uh, started to practice differently and 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 set some protocols uh, beyond those guidelines. That's what we call in France the escalation of oxygen therapy in COVID-19 with many different possibilities uh, and that we, we include in our protocols uh, in, the, in the ED, for example, but also in the ICU with uh, a, 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 an increase of uh, device use in case of deterioration, but also uh, a decreasing uh, requiring, uh, requiring of oxygen supports during the recovery. And as you can see, the first uh, protocols uh, followed those, uh, those practice with uh, low flow nasal cannula, then high flow nasal cannula, and sometimes uh, uh, some NPPV in certain cases, especially with the helmet in, in Italy, with uh, the CPAP and helmet in Italy and uh, requiring less invasive mechanical ventilation. So how we said that, so we put the low flow nasal cannula uh, uh, at first part and protecting with the surgical mask for the type L phenotype. Uh, then if we need more oxygen, we put a uh, low flow nasal cannula and a non rebriefer mask, then uh, also a surgical mask to protect the healthcare providers. Um, and and, and requiring, if we require more oxygen uh, flow, we put some proto in some protocols, the, um, the NIV and HFNC as a, an oxygen support. Um, uh, uh, we had a, a, a reflection even in, the, in our Ministry of Health about using the NIV or uh, non-invasive oxygen support and, and set some differences between the use of one or the other. Oh, sorry. Okay. So we, 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 we put this, this kind of device, the iFlow nasal cannula oxygenation support with humidification in, in some wards and even in some ED and in some uh, critical care unit, uh, avoiding sometimes uh, uh, intubation. The first, actually, the first uh, articles uh, get published uh, the, the last month about this practice with a very good results in, in some category of patients uh, and uh, we, we you can see that uh, in the first protocol who were published uh, in anal of intensive care during the October by Wang and colleagues uh, about um, 27 patients who uh, didn't go uh, straight to the ICU 
and they put on uh, HFNC and an IV and, and uh, among the 17 patients who get HFNC, uh, only uh, seven failed intubation. We uh, with only two ultimately intubated and go, uh, and uh, and put in ICU and uh, with ten success, with an initial P on E F, uh, F ratio uh, of two uh, more than two hundred and twenty, uh, uh, corresponding to the type uh, L uh, phenotype, with good results. So we we set some protections uh, to limit the spreading of the particles, and you can see that uh, on the way uh, in uh, the patients, we put an HME filter, and on the way out to protect uh, either the, the the ventilator or and and the the providers, we put a. a HEPA filter that we tested and with a very low spread of uh, particles using this device. So very interesting. And we we developed more and more uh, wards with this kind of device uh, and put uh, an add, and add uh, a protection with a, a rebreather mask on to limit the direct spreading of the eye flow uh, of, uh, of the nasal cannula. So the we, we put this kind of protocol on with uh, an increasing uh, need of oxygen from the nasal cannula to the rebreather mask, then the non nasal cannula and non rebreather, and uh, requiring the HFNC, then uh, intubation. It was the first step that many, uh, for example, many mm, wards uh, that were a part of the Florali, uh, very well known protocol. Uh, set up this practice with good success. In Italy, uh, they have a different uh, habits uh, regarding the, uh, the non-invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation. They use uh, the, the Helmet CPAP, uh, requiring uh, some mechanical ventilation uh, device, uh, but they were very uh, used uh, with, this, uh, with this practice. And as um, most of their uh, ICU wards is, uh, were a, a common room uh, with 12 or 20 patients, it was very interesting for them to develop this, uh, this practice because with the helmet, you, you, you limit absolutely the spraying of the vi viral um, particles. And it was very interesting for them to, to develop and, 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 and even uh, open some wards with this kind of device uh, uh, and most of their patients were uh, type L but even some more severe patients benefit from this technique. So uh, it was the kind of, of protocol that they use in northern part of Italy uh, going uh, once again from the nasal cannula to the uh, non-invasive uh, positive pressure uh, helmet and, and sometimes limit the, the requiring of the intubation. So very uh, well technique developed uh, by our uh, uh, Italian colleagues. Uh, we limited the, the use of the usual uh, B-level uh, or BiPAP NPPV uh, among uh, our uh, emergency departments or, or ICU. Uh, we limited this, the use of, of the uh, in the COPD only for the COPD patients because of the risk for the healthcare provider of uh, spraying of the viral uh, particles. So uh, this is the kind of protocol that we use with, with those uh, specific patients, uh, COPD patients, and of course, uh, the mechanical ventilation. But um, especially back because we, we, we know uh, a very simple device that we use for more than 20 years now, uh, we decided to test and, and provide some, um, some interest uh, in uh, some uh, non-invasive oxygeners oxygenation support that is not a, a mechanical uh, a device needed, uh, known as the Boussignac CPAP. Boussignac CPAP is very well known now for more than 15 years, in maybe 20 years now, uh, in the uh, EMS in, in France, uh, because uh, we use it 
for a long time uh, regarding the pulmonary uh, acute pulmonary edema uh, with very good results. Uh, we, because of the use of the Businiac CPAP, we, we uh, dramatically dropped the needed of ICU uh, support for our patients uh, uh, and put this kind of this kind of patients uh, in, in directly in the ED uh, with very good results in, in people where you don't need to intubate and put in ICU. So we know this device is a very simple, as you can see. On the, on the drawing uh, on the left, uh, and we tested it uh, even with uh, Georges Boussignac in, in himself, who sadly dead, uh, uh, dead on the last May uh, during the pandemic. And we tested it with the uh, HEMA uh, filters to, to see if the, the device still uh, available and, and efficient. And uh, with very good results, we decided to put some, some patients on this device uh, with the CPAP and the filter. And we had very good results. Uh, actually, uh, there is a, a paper um, published yesterday in uh, uh, European Journal of, of uh, Respiratory Journal, uh, explained that in a ward in southern pass, uh, part of Paris, they put uh, some 70 five patients with this uh, phenotype under the, the CPAP of Boussignac with uh, zero intubation needed. So very good results with non-invasive and non-positive uh, uh, non pressure, uh, meaning by a, by a mechanical requirement was needed and very good results with very simple device. Uh, of the uh, Boussignac CPAP. So uh, we decided to, to, to test it and with good results, we expand in our national guidelines the possibility, especially in the pre-hospital setting, to put on the, the Boussignac CPAP uh, with a titration, actually at the beginning at uh, 15, uh, 15 millimeters I of CPAP with a, a flow of uh, 15 liters, so requiring less oxygen than uh, the high flow nasal cannula. And it was very interesting for, for, for our EMS. So the question remain about the safety of the use of the Boussignac CPAP. And, and we uh, studied it. And especially in Italy, as you can see, they, they compare uh, all the different methods uh, methods uh, of oxygenation. And as you can see, uh, when you put a CPAP of an, uh, on an oral nasal mask uh, up to 20 centimeters uh, of water, you can see there is a negligible air dispersion uh, as it's the case for the Helmet CPAP that they, they use uh, usually. So very interesting device. And if we refer uh, on the previous, previous uh, study that I showed you, you can see that uh, the meaning is that the, the Helmet CPAP or either the Boussignac CPAP is a very good device to protect the healthcare providers. And it's very simple and you need a, 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 an oxygen flow less than for the HFNO. So uh, we started to spread the, the the use of the Boussignac CPAP, and we put it uh, in our uh, national guidelines. So uh, the protocol that we use now uh, in most of the uh, ED uh, in France, it's the, the, the increasing of need from the nasal cannula to the intubation with the use either of the Boussignac CPAP or the HFNO uh, in uh, uh, phenotype L type uh, patients. Sorry, it's a block. So we put in our algorithm, as you can see, uh, as soon as the uh, as the uh, the target is not uh, reached, we put on on CPAP. CPAP. Most of, uh, of the CCU and and, and neurology wards that use this device started to put some patients on a pro pro prone positioning, and continue treatments with very good good results. And sometimes avoiding uh, in mostly in most of the patients the, the needed for for intubation and mechanical ventilation. So you, you will see now uh, an, uh, uh, a short video 
showing you how uh, using the, the, the CPAP with uh, HEPA filter. It's in French, but uh, subtitles are in English. So, uh, Daniel, if you please put the, the video on. Yes, so uh, we will now present the video. Uh, so be aware that there will be some, uh, the presentation is in French and there are some subtitles in English. If you want to reduce the volume of uh, the video, please do so at your end. Uh, you can have the control of the sound for the video. Here we go. Bonjour. Bonjour. Dans cette vidéo, nous allons vidéo. détailler la mise, la mise en place d'une CIPAP, CIPAP de Boussignac chez un patient, chez un patient présentant une atteinte respiratoire liée au, au COVID-19. La CIPAP, la CIPAP de Boussignac est une assistance, une assistance respiratoire non-invasive non qui délivre un niveau de pression constant dans les voies aériennes et qui fonctionne sans électricité et sans ventilateur artificiel. Elle peut donc s'avérer particulièrement utile dans le contexte épidémiologique actuel. Alors de quoi avons-nous besoin Tout d'abord, d'un système boussignac classique, c'est-à-dire un masque de ventilation non-invasive avec son harnais. Attention, n'importe quel masque de VNI peut être utilisé, sauf les masques équipés de fuite intentionnelle qu'il faut proscrire dans cette indication afin d'éviter toute contamination du personnel. Une valve de boussignac et un débitmètre à oxygène autorisant un débit jusqu'à 15 litres par minute, idéalement jusqu'à 20 litres par minute. Chez un patient atteint du Covid-19, nous allons rajouter les éléments suivants. Un filtre échangeur de chaleur et d'humidité, afin de protéger du risque de contamination des soignants. Et pour le connecter, nous aurons besoin d'un raccord droit 22M-22F. Il s'agit d'un connecteur facilement disponible. Celui-ci est par exemple utilisé pour délivrer du monoxyde d'azote chez un patient sous ventilation artificielle. Voyons maintenant la mise en place de la CIPAP de Boussignac chez un patient COVID-19 qui nécessite un débit d'oxygène de 6 litres par minute ou plus. En dehors de la chambre, il faut préparer et assembler le matériel. Il faut dans un premier temps connecter le filtre échangeur de chaleur et d'humidité, puis le connecteur droit, puis la valve de Boussignac. Si la chambre n'est pas équipée de pression négative ou de système de filtrage portatif, nous ouvrons la fenêtre pendant le soin. Il est préférable d'être deux afin de faciliter le positionnement du masque. Ensuite, il faut bien respecter l'ordre dans lequel le système doit être mis en place. On met en place le harnais du masque de VNI alors que le patient a toujours son masque à oxygène. On coupe l'oxygène, on retire le masque à oxygène, puis rapidement, mais avec soin, on installe le masque de VNI sur le visage du patient. On connecte le système à l'oxygène, puis en s'écartant, on allume l'oxygène jusqu'à un débit de 15 à 20 litres par minute. Voilà, le système est en place. Il peut rester ainsi 6 à 12 heures sans problème, voire en continu. Une fois le soin terminé, nous fermons la fenêtre. Pour retirer le système, il faut là encore suivre un ordre précis. On coupe l'oxygène. On déconnecte l'oxygène. On retire le masque de VNI que l'on dépose dans un premier temps sur le lit. On installe le masque à oxygène. On connecte l'oxygène puis on allume l'oxygène. Ensuite, on désinfecte l'intérieur du masque au moyen d'une lingette imprégnée d'un désinfectant de surface. Puis on le laisse dans la chambre. Voilà, en suivant l'ensemble de ces recommandations, vous pouvez utiliser la CIPAP de Boussignac chez un patient Covid-19, tout en limitant le risque de contamination du personnel soignant.
Ok. Le micro. This was the this was the presentation uh, that we had uh, concerning the uh, video. So I uh, let you engaged again, Nicolas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Let, let, uh, let me tell you that the, the, the video is available in Spanish uh, also with another demonstration uh, and, and uh, you can uh, download it from uh, YouTube uh, as you want. So, and it, of course, it will be available with the, the recording of, of the webinar. So we... we in addition, one point is has been uh, translated as well in German lately, so... <laughs> okay. That's fine. Uh, so we started to have some evidence and feedback from the use of the Boussignac CPAP uh, that, will, that we had from France, but also from other uh, country now. Uh, that was uh, set, for example, in the northern part of Paris in a neurology ward, not in ICU. With, uh, with a, a study that was presented uh, and very interesting last month. Uh, in this study, uh, once they put the, some patients in the Boussignac CPAP in a non-ICU ward, uh, it was very interesting that uh, that decreased the number needed to put in ICU in their, in their hospital. So a very uh, interesting in, in, in terms of uh, logistical uh, need and approach uh, to those patients. So it was very interesting to, to read this paper and to have their experience feedback, actually. Uh, as you can see on, on the logigram, how they, they, they set the, the use of the, the CPAP in their, in their wards with a very low uh, need of uh, ICU and, and where, where the patients uh, were treated uh, very soon uh, with a very low uh, um, uh, morbid mortality in, in these cases. Uh, so uh, let me show you the international, the French guidelines that we we set with the health ministry during the late March and, and the beginning of, uh, of last April, and as you can see, uh, we put the Boussignac on the pre-hospital setting and the in-hospital setting uh, before the ICU uh, or the ward hospitalization with uh, possibility uh, of putting the patients either on uh, CPAP or uh, oxygen, uh, high flow oxygen uh, nasal cannula in, in other cases. So we, we change uh, our guidelines regarding the practice and the good results that we have uh, we had from the field. And now it's, it's spread around all the country. And uh, lastly, this slide to give you a proposed oxygen support algorithm that we use uh, mainly in our uh, emergency departments. And as you can see, uh, we there is an increasing of need. Uh, if you if you need to set uh, an algorithm with the increasing need of oxygen, you can uh, you can put in your protocol the the the, the step up either uh, uh, especially for northern part of Italy with the helmet or the or, or the Boussignac step up is uh, a bit more simple to use actually. Uh, and this is the kind of, uh, of algorithm that we use now on everyday basis, uh, requiring the oxygen uh, in COVID patients. So very, um, I'm very pleased that I, can, I could set this, this webinar for you and I hope that it will help you to, to set your, your practice and give you some information about different kind of oxygen supports that we can use. Uh, now regarding uh, our, our patients, and I will be pleased to answer your questions. I think, uh, Daniel, you had, you had some already? Yeah, I have some uh, some questions, uh, so I will be uh, very pleased to uh, to tell you the questions, and uh, you can answer uh, uh, after on the one-by-one. 
basis, I've seen that the audience has been as well very active, and thank you very much for your questions as well, and we will we will answer those. So here are the uh, questions that we, we had in general. So one of them is, there is no alarm. Our current medical staff during the crisis are not specialists in non-invasive ventilation since they have come from other departments as reinforcement, as we have seen in, effectively in some of the hospital. Uh, is there any increase of risk of barotrauma or volutrauma? So first, as you have seen uh, on the short video uh, presentation by uh, by Professor Carto, uh, it's very easy to set actually. So, with uh, in our in our uh, emergency department, where once the the nurses and and uh, respiratory uh, therapists were not aware of this practice, we set some uh, some. Uh, some training about one or two hours uh, for the for for the the team, and it was very easy to to set and to especially for for how to put off the device that is more difficult than to put on, uh, respectively to 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 be aware of the protection of the the healthcare provider. So, but you need only one to two hours of, of training to 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 know how to put this device. But at the beginning, there is always a, a doctor to put on the patient. But after, for the for the, the monitoring, uh, it it was done. It, it is done by by uh, by nurses, of course. So there is no uh, risk of barotrauma or volutrauma because it's an open uh, device. That's the main difference between this device. Uh, who get the positive pressure because of uh, of a, a virtual valve made by very high flow gases, but uh, if the patients need uh, need more oxygen, he, he can have more oxygen. If he needs less, he can have less. There is no uh, risk for for the alveolis actually because uh, of the open uh, system set on this CPAP. So it's very uh, easy to to monitor by nurses because they just have to monitor the the spo2 and adapt the flow regarding the the spo2 between 15 and 20 centimeters hqo uh, and there is of course no volume trauma because of the characteristic of the device itself so it's 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 not dangerous <laughs> okay thank you so let's go to the next question is there any so of contamination of the caregivers when using the Boussignac CPAP? That was the main issue at the beginning when we reflect, we had the reflection about how to set this very useful device that we we are trained to use for many years uh, regarding the, the risk for the healthcare providers. But uh, very quickly with uh, Georges Boussignac himself, we, we tested the different kind of, uh, of uh, filter. First, to, to, to protect the healthcare providers, of course, but also to see if the flow still the same. Because as, as I said, it's a virtual valve needed a, a certain amount of oxygen. And we wanted to, to check if the, the, the device itself still with the same uh, mechanism. So there is no, uh, there is a, a, a very teeny, uh, decrease of the flow, but it's not uh, clinically relevant. So it was very uh, reassuring for us that the, the, the flow and the mechanism itself still the same. So you can use, uh, you have to use the HAPA filter to protect your, 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 your healthcare providers. And you can yeah. use it without uh, any uh, decreasing of the efficacy of the system. Yes, because we have some questions related uh, afterwards. Um, the next one is, um, but if you use a filter, the system becomes closed, so... No, because, no, actually, because the oxygen and, and, and air particles are, uh, are smaller than the, the diameters of the, of the holes in the filters. The, the diameters are, are pretty uh, small, of course, to, to let the, the viral particles uh, in, in the in the inside part of the of the filter but uh, there's no uh, there is no effect on the air and oxygen particles 
Okay, okay no resistance through. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, next one, uh, uh, is it necessary to continue, continue uh, measures? Yeah. <laughs> Which person do it? No, actually, you, uh, when you put on the, the, the device, uh, you just have to check. There is a green part on the on the on the on the gauge, uh, and you have just to set the flow to obtain the good uh, positive pressure that you need. Uh, usually, it's between seven and ten. Uh, regarding the uh, objective of SpO2 you want. And once you're still in the green, you can let the, the, the device on because as it's an open one, an open flow device, uh, you don't have to set again your pressure. The pressure will still the same. Very good. So another one, is it a new product? I'm afraid of unreported effect. Just no, I, actually, I, I answer for uh, at the beginning. It's not, it's not. It's not a, a new product. Uh, actually, when I started my career as an emergency physician, uh, maybe you don't know, but in France we have a physician staff EMS, and uh, that changed my practice. Uh, we had a, a paradigm shift, uh, putting the 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 uh, acute pulmonary edema in ICU where it was our, our usual practice, but once we put this uh, device on people, uh, we, we still remain less than 5% uh, of the usual patient we put in ICU, uh, we, we put in simple ward in, in emergency de department. That changed our practice for more than 20 years now. Even before uh, the, the the mechanical ventilation and PPV that we use uh, on everyday basis for 15, 12 or 15 years now, in pre-hospital setting, uh, we still use the the, the Vucignac CPAP in in many cases because it's very simple uh, uh, to put on, to set, and and very simple to monitor. So that's why it's it's uh, it's uh, an old old uh, device, but uh, very modern one, too. And very efficient. <laughs> yeah. As you can see. Well, okay, so now we are going, if, you, um, if you're happy about this, to uh, answer the questions from the audience. So I will go to the first one. It's, uh, we have question mainly related to the EPA filter. So the uh, first one I have here, is our EPA filters really mandatory, or could we consider the electrostatic uh, filters so actually we tested uh, more than uh, 25 available filters uh, on this device uh, and uh, actually the only uh, the HEPA uh, recorded uh, uh, filters uh, are the the one to use because of the diameters of the small uh, Holes that there's inside uh, that can limit the, the the spreading of the viral um, particles. So you, you need to use a, a mandatory HEPA, but still the device is efficient uh, for what you have to do. So so of course you you can put another filter, but without the same efficiency regarding the safety. Yeah. Okay. Not on, on the oxygen flow, but the safety. Yes. Okay, we have another one here. According to uh, WHO, we can use both EPA and recommended for COVID due to impossibility of particles. Not sure to understand the question. Are there studies available which proves that the CPAP, the spreading is uh, the lowest? Uh, actually, I showed you the, the, the first article uh, regarding the spreading of the uh, the of the particles and and very very good results uh yes. once, once you you put a, an oral nasal mask and, and the cpap on so it's 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 less that we expected actually so we we expected that 10 to 12 centimeters very very slow but uh, still it's it's negligible so it's okay. better than uh, what we expected. Uh, we have a good question here. Uh, when must we change the EPA filters? There are any European protocol about that? 
So, sorry about the change of the filter. Uh, when must we change the EPA filters? Uh, there are any European protocol about? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not aware about a European uh, rec recommendation or guidelines about the filters. But uh, for example, in the the world. Uh, of uh, Professor Guillaume Carto, um, they, they got a word of 40, 40 patients with uh, the Boussignac CPAP on, sometimes for, uh, for uh, a six or two eight hour sessions, so very long. Uh, the main uh, protocol that they use is that they change the filter uh, at each uh, utilization of the device. So if you, if you need to put uh, something like six or eight sessions a day, you need six to, to eight uh, filters change changes. So, um, but there is no recommendation. It's just uh, just to limit again the, 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 the spreading of the particle virus. And just to let you know that in their worlds of uh, 40 patients for now more than eight months, there were only one uh, healthcare worker uh, com contamination uh, among more than uh, 90 people. So it's very few uh, contamination. And we, we think that uh, the contamination is from the, the uh, from the private part of, uh, of the people. It's not in, in the world. So uh, there, were, there were very few contaminations, uh, even in, in the non-ICU worlds where they use the, the the CPAP of Bussigny, the Bussigny CPAP. Thank you. Uh, another one we have here is, according to your knowledge until uh, now, no, what amount of patients avoid the next level of ventilation while using the Bussignac CPAP on third level? And why haven't uh, used manometer in through procedure? Thank you. Uh, so first, regarding the manometer, is because they are so used uh, to put the the Boussignac CPAP on that I think they just uh, forgot to to do it, and and you will see that um, as it, again as it's uh, an open circuit ventilation device, uh, even if you put a, a, a higher uh, flow of oxygen, there is no risk. So. Um, I think uh, Professor Carto is very. You, I, I'm, I, I know that it, it, it's, it's a device that he, he used for many years, and I think it just uh, it's just the case that he forgot it. Um, uh, according to the the results, he showed me that he. I think that they are on process to 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 publish it uh, for the first wave results and, and analysis that they get. Uh, according to their results, uh, less than 5% of the patients of this ward, the specific ward where they put 40 patients uh, during all the first uh, wave and still go on now uh, with the second wave, uh, they, they had less that they had uh, less than 5% uh, of patients needed intubation and mechanical ventilation with very good results on uh, on the on the outcomes even from the people getting to ICU so uh, the results are pretty good and as i mentioned before uh, during the talk i told you that the 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 team of uh, Professor uh, uh, Jesus uh, Gonzalez in southern part of Paris, uh, who set a word in neurology, not in ICU like uh, Professor Carto, uh, set a word of, of neurology with uh, 75 patients requiring uh, eye flow or uh, Boussignac CPAP oxygen oxygenation support, and they got zero patients needed intubation and mechanical ventilation and the, the, the paper just published yesterday. So I, I invite you to, to see the paper in the European uh, Respiratory Journal and you can see even if it's a, a resp retrospective a cohort study that the results are pretty good in this kind of patient. 
Thank you. I think this was the last questions that uh, we had. Uh, I thank you very much for the participation of all of you that are live on this webinar. And uh, I would like uh, especially to thank you, Professor Beshansky, for your presentation uh, to this uh, uh, webinar organized by Wagen Group. And thank you as well to all of you that, and Professor Beshansky, for what you're doing for the patients suffering from COVID and uh, to the great support to the, to the family, uh, not to forget uh, in this uh, challenging uh, situation. So thank you all. Thank you very much. And, and, and you know, uh, sorry. don't hesitate to, to, to send questions to, to Vigon Group, and I will be pleased to, to answer your, your even more question about uh, the use of the Boussignac CPAP if you need. Thank you, and see you next time on the, our next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.